both horror and non-horror fans alike have seen or heard of movies like The Shining or Hereditary or The Ring, but what about the ones that went a bit under the radar? Here is the most underrated horror movie from every year of the 21st century, 2000 to today. And to make it fun, I'll also be including horror comedies. You can check out my other horror roundups on my channel. Let's do this. 2000 Hollow Man. Ooh, this one got terrible reviews. And this was back in 2000. They couldn't do the Joker 2 thing and just spam social media and hope to spin the movie into good graces. Nope, nope, nope. Critics hated it, and that was that. And I'll say right now, I wouldn't call it great, but I do think it's better than the reviews imply. It's got creative visual effects that were ahead of its time, and an interesting, if not downright sadistic, main character. What some people found distasteful was the sexual perversion that came with someone turning invisible. Leering, groping, sexual assault, much of it is hard to watch. But I think there is something inherently perverted about being invisible. It's voyeurism, watching people who don't know they're being watched. And in the hands of a guy who so desperately wants to be the charming bad boy, invisibility being used this way isn't just believable, but expected. Apart from all of that, the movie moves fast and gets a lot of mileage out of its core concept. The scene in the rain is really cool. It's not a profound movie, but as a fun, somewhat sleazy midnight rental, Hollow Man hits the spot. 2001 Suicide Club This one has one of the most striking elevator pitches. All across Japan, young people are ending their lives for seemingly no reason. The film hits the gas immediately, with a haunting scene of students in a metro, laughing and chatting and then holding hands and counting down before leaping joyously into an oncoming train. You can probably guess where the film goes from here, and you'd be wrong. Suicide Club moves in bizarre directions. I can't find a high quality version of this anywhere, but in a weird way that kind of works. As gory as the movie is, and literally the blood is Kool-Aid explosions, it's also a gritty, dirty, bootleg kind of experience. Something that you come across by accident. It's easily one of the strangest movies on the list, with some great scenes and a sense of recklessness that I really appreciate. 2002 Queen of the Damned Normally, I discuss May, a film that should be a horror classic, but I've talked about it 10 times on this channel. Queen of the Damned was honestly one of the most entertaining viewing experiences I've had in a while. Oh, it's got flaws, ooh, ooh boy. <laughs> but most of them are kind of adorable in a Skyrim glitch kind of way. The lead actor gives a cheesy performance, but it kind of works because he never pulls back from it, and it suits this early 2000s gothic vibe. He reminded me a lot of Ian Somerhalder from Vampire Diaries. Unfortunately, Aliyah just isn't good, and the climax is a total mess. Queen of the Damned made me laugh rather than be annoyed in its sillier moments, but there are aspects I think are legitimately good. The friend's performance is solid, the music hits hard, the violin scene is a highlight, and many of the practical effects are impressive. It also has the most soul-crushing post-nut clarity in history. This goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, it's much, 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 much better and ballsier and more fucking fun than Twilight. The vampires aren't they going to be pissed off that you're giving away their secrets? Mm, I imagine they are, yes. Do you have anything else to say to the other vampires listening out there? As a matter of fact, I do. Come out, come out, wherever you are. 2003, Final Destination 2. I almost want to put Freddy vs. Jason. Not a good movie, but honestly, that cornfield scene is incredible. Like, where did that come from? It's like when the hockey mask was real. Dude, that goalie was pissed about something. I actually rewatched Final Destination 2 a couple nights ago and enjoyed it even more this time. The original concept centers on people cheating death and then death taking them out one by one. And this is the good kind of sequel that takes that idea and expands on it. The kills are more elaborate, the lore is expanded, and there is more of a detective plot here with symbols and foreshadowing. The series is renowned for its splatterific intro sequences, and the highway scene from number two is the best, like no competition. It also probably has the best death scene overall. It's got some of the best kills and a pretty good plot. So at the very least, watch that highway scene on YouTube. 2004, The Grudge Remake. 
The Grudge avoids most pitfalls of the American remake. It's not a one-to-one -one copy, but still retains much of that dreamlike, unsettling mood. It's set in Japan, and is directed by Takashi Shimizu, who directed the original film. On top of that, The Grudge made the intelligent decision to reuse the house. Something about the layout, the balcony, and small rooms instill a sense of mystery and claustrophobia. Like the original, space and elevation play key roles. The security feed sequence is creepy as hell, and Sarah Michelle Gellar holds her own as the lead. It's also more visceral. So many remakes of Asian films miss the mark, but I think this one is worth checking out. 2005, Isolation. Do you get off on the gooey practical effects of body horror? No? Good, because that's kind of weird. But if you do enjoy them as much as I do, like in The Thane or The Fly, Isolation may scratch that itch. The characters here are running experiments on cows, and the film goes elbow deep into the body horror. Whether it's the parasitic corruptions or the violence that happens later, all the practical effects are gruesome and wild. The environment is dark, muddy, and full of the squelching of boots. Isolation knows that its setting and effects are why people are here, so these sequences are long enough to appreciate. 2006, Touristas. Is there a name for this genre where tourists get hunted in an exotic location? No, I'm, I'm seriously asking. None of these movies are amazing or anything, but they're fast-paced and colorful, and Touristas feels like the blueprint for all of them in the best sort of way. It preys upon the natural fear of being a tourist, losing the passport, being taken advantage of by the locals, and waking up without kidneys. I do try to recommend horror movies for viewing experiences. Some are great whenever, some are better alone, and Teristas excels with some friends. So grab some buddies and watch this. Better wait for the bus. There's a bus? We're, we're, when's there a bus? Quanda, uh, uh, what time? Uh, today. Today there's a bus? Hey, what today. time? Let's go. What time? What is it now? Today. Today. 2007, Inside. Part of the new wave French extremity movement of the mid-2000s, Inside is one of the more vicious ones from France. It's a home invasion film, and the fact the protagonist is pregnant works wonders for the plot. She is slower, more vulnerable, and has to survive for two people. And this isn't the kind of story to keep her scratch-free. She gets hurt. A lot of people get hurt. And the way the action is shot, the makeup effects, and especially the actors' performances make you hurt just by watching. It is an unforgivingly violent film. And the fact that it's not only plausible, but has happened in real life, only ratchets up the horror more. 2008, Lake Mungo. Ah, this movie. It's a pseudo-documentary, but it's by far the most believable fake documentary I've seen, and you could easily convince someone it was real. The natural acting and original music all give it that authenticity. Lake Mungo sneaks up on you imperceptibly. It is the sneakiest horror movie. Blurry footage, disturbing backstories, and physical side effects slowly feed you this foreboding, cloaking sort of feeling, like you're tunneling somewhere and can't turn back. My god, the third act reveal only becomes more horrifying the more you think about it. There is nothing wrong with you if you aren't a fan of this style. For some, this will slowly terrify you. And for the rest, at least you get a good ghost story. Happy birthday, Jim and 2009, The Collector. I considered Pandorum, the sci-fi horror flick that was like the video game Dead Space if the SS Ishimura smelled worse, yet The Collector will always jump to my mind because it satisfies a specific niche, something people are craving for, but the movie just doesn't have the clout. In short, The Collector is like Home Alone meets the Saw franchise. The serial killer is precise, unfazed, and dedicates who knows how much time to elaborate booby traps. Nothing worse than a game of The Floor is Lava taken to heart. If you're the type to watch the traps from Saw on YouTube, check out The Collector because you get more traps, less plot, and better actors. And just a side note, if you do like these videos, toss me a subscribe, it means a lot.
2010, The Reef. I've mentioned this before, but shark movies, in terms of percentage, have a straight up terrible good to bad ratio. Like Disney remake level, or Kanye West hit song to public embarrassment. But The Reef is one of the good ones. The characters are easy to empathize with, and one in particular became a straight up hero in a natural but inspiring way. The realism of the shark attacks is what got to me. No scene rises to the overdramatic, and I quickly became absorbed. I don't like that in so, so many horror films, the characters are written as unlikable fuckwads. And sure, there's something fun in seeing a fictional dipshit get Pez dispensered, but I think we can do better. The Reef is simple panic and teamwork between characters that seem like real people. It's not Jaws, but it hits hard and without a doubt is miles better than 90% of shark content out there. 2011, Grave Encounters. There are better found footage, horror, and horror comedies than this one. But I still liked it a lot, not just for some interesting ideas and genuine tension, but for its surprises. It starts out hilarious, following a group of fraudulent ghost hunters, which might be the most redundant phrase on earth. See, there's a distinct look and voice when people are knowingly creating bad or misleading content as a group. I saw it every single day when I worked at a company that I won't mention, but rhymed with Bickbock. I laughed quite a few times watching these guys struggle with the charade. But once they actually find something worth filming, we witness an arc from exhilaration to pandemonium. It's as if these evil spirits are making them atone for clickbait. Grave Encounters offers plenty of satisfying setups and payoffs, and the actors sold the growing desperation of the situation. For the love of John Carpenter, do not watch the sequel. It went the meta Blair Witch 2 route, and <laughs> there's not a drink strong enough to power you through it. Okay. Yeah. Listen, guys, this is fucking pointless, all right? If we were to find it, he would. The range of the mother walk. Holy shit! Holy shit! Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. 2012 Grabbers. Earlier I mentioned that I'm including horror comedies on this list, and a big reason for that is so I can shout out the Irish creature feature Grabbers. The concept is fantastic. Just, just listen. Blood-sucking, tentacled monsters have invaded a small Irish village, and their weakness is blood with a high alcohol content. So our band of adorable heroes must defeat them while blackout drunk. I have a nail gun and a board with a nail in it. The characters are all very entertaining to watch, the movie looks wonderful, and I appreciate that the monsters are allowed to be colorful. As silly of a setup this is, I would call Grabbers a smart movie too. Our two lead cops are polar opposites. She's the rule-abiding worker, and he's the depressed alcoholic. And yet, in the third act, they trade roles. So we see her as the fun-loving drunk, and see him take the reins and become a leader. Both character arcs are believable and satisfying, and both actors do a great job. Grabbers is so much fun. You want to be inside this movie and play. Never likes me as much as her. She was as a talented one. Daddy's a girl. <laughs> Bitch. 2013, Mama. I feel like many monsters we get fall into two camps. The wispy, shadowy kind, or the drippy, droopy ones that look like they just ate bad in and out Also known as in and out All right, everyone, gird your loins. Mama's creature is a bit of the former, but the noises she makes feel born from the forest. She doesn't shriek, she howls in a low, throaty kind of way that implies something unearthed after many years. She sounds angry, but also wounded, and it's that combination that makes her so scary to me. There's a scene in the house where someone is using a camera flash for visibility, and her yells become more loud and upset, and Jesus fucking Christ, if I saw this thing alone at night, I could have shit my britches. Mama is well shot, using its framing in clever ways. The child performances are strong, and the opening credits serve as effective exposition. The tone at the end switches in a way that a lot of people didn't like, and Jessica Chastain is super miscast. But for a quick and aggressively frightening movie, I think Mama should have gotten more attention. Hey, Bernsey!
2014, as above, so below. It's found footage horror meets Indiana Jones. What I admire is how much the film plays with different ideas. One room exists as a sound vacuum. Other rooms feature impossibly placed objects like cars and pianos to bring up latent trauma of some of the climbers. In one harrowing sequence, someone becomes stuck in a crevice filled with bones. There's so much going on here and none of it feels out of place. Is it scary? Mostly no. Is it perfect? Of course not. It's called As Above, So Below, not the presidential debate moderator's jawline. Ooh, first, yowza. But I don't often see found footage reach so high and experiment this much. 2015, The Hallow. You gotta love Irish horror movies. Even if they don't scare you, even if they're a 6 out of 10, they look great and the gore is as brutal as the accents are delightful. The Hallow is oozing with atmosphere, dirt, moss, mold, and decay. You can practically feel the grit under your fingernails. And this includes the monsters, which are created with practical effects and all appear as if birthed from the roots of a tree. Anyone even semi-interested in effects work, makeup, and monster design should consider this a must-watch. Two thousand sixteen, Under the Shadow. What a year for horror, full of very highly rated films. The Wailing, Raw, Train to Busan, Don't Breathe, Split. But Under the Shadow isn't just underrated, but acts as a fresh and so clean, clean reminder that your horror setting doesn't just have to be in a creepy mansion, a creepy forest, or a creepy podcast. And that setting can provide so much groundwork for the plot and the scares. Under the Shadow takes place in war-torn Iran, and as a result, it does something I wish more horror movies did. It doesn't allow a reprieve. There's no break. At night, the spirits come. In the day, the bombs do. It may not scare you unless you find sentient blankets terrifying, but it's one of the better war horror films for sure. Check it out. 2017, One Cut of the Dead. Best to go into this one blind. All I'll say is that it's about a zombie film being made that turns into an actual zombie attack and then turns into something else. There's an amazing long take in the first act, and the third act is glorious. It rewards you for paying attention to moments both small and large. It's a sublime punchline that you didn't even know was being set up. A wonderful film for filmmakers and one of the best horror comedies out there. Simply nothing like it. 2018 in Fabric. Let's play a game. Which of the following don't appear in the horror movie In Fabric? A. People being hypnotized by washing machine instructions. B. A woman dreaming about being in a fashion magazine and starving to death. C. A murderous dress. Or D. A ritual involving a menstruating mannequin. The answer is that you need to watch this movie. Just be ready for something weird. 2019 Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark PG-13 horror movies usually feel like an adult-sized suit being badly tailored to fit a child. Imagine my shock that Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark was actually pretty good. As a millennial, my hopes were not high. This will blow the minds of younger viewers, but for many 90s kids, a favorite pastime was going to book fairs. It was a joyous occasion, and easily the most sought-after books were these scary stories to tell in the Dark series. They were probably my first experience with horror, and a PG-13 movie sounded awful. But they did a good job. Both the actors and characters were charming, and the art department did exemplary work recreating the monsters from the books. The film also knew how to provoke fear while navigating that rating. I would highly recommend this to tweens and teens for Halloween. 2020, The Wolf of Snow Hollow. So far, this is my favorite movie of 2020. It's a bit hard to describe. It's a werewolf movie, but also a character drama and a dark comedy. 
The protagonist practically trips over his flaws to get to work. He's a stressed alcoholic on the verge of mental collapse. But the honestness and earnestness in which he has written and performed make him endearing. The film has some great editing, a lovely credit sequence, and effective scenes of anxiety. Some moments are intense, others are quite beautiful, and a solitary shot of a man standing to full height has never left my brain. For a relatively short film, there's a lot going on in its plot and characters, yet none of it comes across as rushed. Watch the first 10 or so minutes, get a feel for it. Her, her, what? Her, her head, her, her head is gone. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I can't, I can't hear you. You gotta They're speak up. They're saying it's a wolf. Two thousand twenty-one, the Innocents. What makes the Innocents work isn't just the usual stuff: evocative cinematography, solid sound design, great acting, but it's how expertly it mixes themes of childhood with supernatural horror. If children could suddenly use telekinesis and mind control, how would they act? How does their upbringing, their parents, affect their choices with these powers? Would they make friends? or lose them. What I love most of all is that the kids come across like kids. You're very much a fly on the wall, watching a playground that gets shrouded in horror as the movie goes on. I'd recommend this to mostly anyone, but I'd be fascinated to know what teachers or parents think about it. 2022, Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. This was kind of a weird year for horror. Smile was a stinky stew of better movies. If Crimes of the Future felt like someone flatlining, then Speak No Evil was the weird smell that neighbors called 911 about. But then you got X and Pearl and Resurrection and Nope. And as far as underrated, I'm gonna go with the horror comedy Bodies, Bodies, Bodies for not just being way better than the trailer implied, but because I think this should be Generation Z's Scream. All the characters have depth, and the plot always keeps you guessing without being frustrating. The score by Disasterpiece fits the vibe perfectly. Rachel Sennett stole this movie. She is hilarious and elevates every piece of dialogue they give her. It's a party mixed with a murder mystery with plenty of funny social commentary. It's a blast. You don't have to think he's attractive. Only Alice has to think that he's attractive. Like, I feel like I'm more attractive than that. You do? Absolutely. And what are the features that you're bringing to Well, the I just look like I fuck. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I look like I, f I fuck, and that's the vibe I like to put out there. Yeah. No, uh, yeah, he's, he's really handsome, whatever. 2023, The Conference. I'll be frank, this one starts a little rusty, maybe not the right word, but the way it comments on office culture feels so outdated, it's already aged by the time the punchline is done. Yet, when the movie gives up the comedy and just decides to be a slasher, my god, I was having the best time from that point on. There are memorable shots, the kills are imaginative, and the villain should be known as one of the slasher greats. He clearly knows the woods, he has the know-how around different weapons and tools, and he slaughters with zero remorse. But he also gets hurt on occasion, and you never lose sight that this is a man on a mission, not some demigod. And I love just how much variety is on display when it comes to the violence. Basically, it's like if REI made a slasher film. And 2024, The First Omen. Long Legs is probably the most talked about horror flick this year. Second place is The Crow remake, but talked about in the same way you talk about a crazy idiot on the subway and avoid eye contact. But I can't give the spot to anything but The First Omen because I, like most people, heard about a prequel to The Omen and thought, No! God, please, no! No! until I saw it, and can't shut up about this beautiful, psychedelic wonder of a horror film. Unlike the recent Apartment 7A, this doesn't just act as a copy-paste of the original, but explores themes of possession, sexuality, fate, and vocation. The cinematography is gorgeous, the use of framing is purposeful and interesting, and I kept wanting to stop the film just to see certain shots again. It very much has its own visual personality. The first Omen kept surprising me with how emotionally effective and haunting scenes became, whether it's a disturbing pregnancy scene or a long shot of a terrified eyeball. Strange, unsettling, and oftentimes fearless, 
The first omen is a hidden gem that needs more love. So, did I miss any films? Let me know in the comments and stay tuned for my yearly Actually Scary video which should be up in a few days. Comment, subscribe, it means a lot, and as always, thanks for watching.